Good day, class. For today's topic, we will be talking about biorisk management and the AMP model. At the end of this lecture, the students will be able to explain the importance of biorisk management. We will also be discussing the AMP model and also identify risk assessment, mitigation, and performance evaluation procedures. In working with infectious agents and toxins in laboratories, one must consider the practices and procedures on biocontainment to ensure biosafety and biosecurity. That is why proper management is very necessary to carry out the total safety of laboratory workers and patients. Let us now define what biorisk means. It means that it is the risk associated to biological toxins or infectious agents. The source of risk may be unintentional exposure to unauthorized access, accidental release or loss, theft, misuse, diversion, or intentional unauthorized release of biohazards. When we say biorisk management, it is already the integration or the incorporation of both biosafety and biosecurity principles to manage risks when working with biological toxins and infectious agents. This definition is from CWA 15793, the Laboratory Biorisk Management Standards. Another definition of biorisk management, according to the CEN Workshop Agreement 15793-2011, it means or it is defined as a system or process to control safety and security mm -hmm. risk associated with the handling or storage and disposal of biological agents and toxins in laboratories and facilities. Biorisk management encompasses the identification, understanding, and management aspects of a system in interrelated processes. It is actually divided into three primary components, the very famous AMP model, that is assessment, mitigation, and performance. These components are collectively captured by what is called the AMP model from the World Health Organization, and this model requires that control measures be based on a robust risk assessment and a continuous evaluation of effectiveness and suitability of the control measures. Identified risks can be either mitigated, avoided, limited, transferred to an outside entity, or can be accepted. As what you can see in the diagram, the biorisk management model is like a three-legged stool. So if one system fails or one or two of the components fails, then the biorisk management fails. In contrast to other risk management models, which typically focuses heavily on mitigation measures, this AMP model is focusing on all the components with equal attention. That's why it's very important that the entire um, system works hand in hand and must be harmonious so that um, the entire system succeeds. An important step in protecting the laboratory personnel's health and safety is recognizing the different workplace hazards and the different possible injuries that they bring. Specific hazards require specific responsiveness to avoid untoward incidents in the laboratory. Also, early prevention from exposure and contact to hazardous activities or materials must be eliminated as soon as possible. That is why in the biorisk management, the first key component or the initial step in implementation is risk assessment. This includes the identification of hazards and characterization of risks that are possibly present in the laboratory. When we say hazard class, this refers to anything in the environment that has the potential to cause harm, while risk 
This is generally defined as the possibility that something bad or unpleasant such as an injury or a loss will happen. In order for a risk to occur, there must be a situation for the hazard to cause harm. Like, let's say for example, there is a sharp needle that is being used by a medical technologist. So this sharp needle class is considered the hazard. So this is the thing that has the potential to cause harm to the user. But if no one is using the sharp needle, then the needle will not pose any risk. So this needle will not cause harm or anything bad or unpleasant or an injury that could happen. More specifically, risk is the likelihood that an adverse event involving a specific hazard or threat will occur followed by the consequences of that occurrence. In performing the risk assessment class, there is already a structured and a repeatable process that can be followed. Step one, you must define the situation. When you say defining the situation, that is when we identify both the hazards and the risk of the biological agents that needs to be handled. Aside from that, you also need to look for the at-risk hosts who could be either humans or animals inside and outside the laboratory. The work activities and laboratory environment that includes the location, the procedures done in that laboratory, and also the equipment and materials that is found within the vicinity of the laboratory as well as the outside vicinity of that laboratory. Let's identify the different types of safety hazards. You write this down, this cannot be found in your notes, so listen carefully. We have identified seven types of safety hazards and that includes number one biologic hazard of course the main source of biologic hazards are infectious agents and the possible injury that can be obtained from this type of hazard are bacterial fungal viral or parasitic infections another type would be sharp hazards and the main source of this type of hazard is needles lancets and broken glasses the possible injuries that can be obtained out from sharps are the cuts punctures or even bloodborne pathogen exposure such as hepatitis c virus human immunodeficiency virus hepatitis b viruses those types of exposure Next would be chemical hazards, and the main source for this type of hazards are the preservatives and reagents used in the laboratory. The possible injuries that can be obtained out from chemical hazards are the exposure to poisonous, caustic, or carcinogenic agents. Next would be radioactive hazards, and the main source are from the equipment and radioisotopes that can give out radioactive waves. So this is harmful to either the fetus or if there is generalized exposure to radiation, this can give untoward effects to the human body, even to animals and also the environment, by the way, class. Another common type of safety hazards is the electrical type. So the main source for this are ungrounded or wet equipment and frayed cords. As what you can see there in the example that is flashed now on the screen, those are the different main sources of electrical hazards. The possible injury can be burns, shock, or even death. Fire or explosive type of hazards can cause burns or dismemberment or can also even be death. The ones that can be found inside the laboratory, either Bunsen burners, organic chemicals, or anything that can cause fire and explosion. Last but not the least, the physical type of safety hazards, which can cause falls, 
sprains or strains to the laboratory technicians or the medical technologists or anyone in the workplace. The main source of this can be wet floors, heavy boxes, and you can be toppled over, and patients also. All right, so we're done defining the different types of safety hazards. Let's go back to the steps in the risk assessment. We're now defining the situation. Next is defining the risk. So in defining the risk class, you must review how individuals inside and outside a laboratory may be exposed to those different types of hazards. It could either be through droplets, inhalation, ingestion, or in inoculation in case a biological agent has been identified as the hazard. Now that we're done identifying the situation, we also identify the hazards and defining the risk. The next thing that we have to do is to characterize the risk. When you say characterize the risk, you will... Compare the likelihood and the consequences of infection, either qualitatively or quantitatively. The job can be made easier with the help of a risk assessment matrix. And so this is how they do it in order to identify if the risks are acceptable or not. The second fundamental component of the virus management model is Mitigation procedures. Virus mitigation measures are actions and control measures that are put into place to reduce or either eliminate the risks associated with biological agents and toxins. There are actually five major areas of control or measures that can be employed in mitigating the risks. The hierarchy of controls of mitigation measures are very easy to memorize and to understand. In the diagram class, you can see there that the most difficult type of mitigation measures, but considered to be the most effective mitigation measure is elimination. The easiest to implement, but the least effective mitigation measure is the personal protective equipment. Allow me to walk you through the different types of mitigation measures one by one. Elimination class involves the total decision not to work with a specific biological agent or even not doing the intended work. Due to this choice, elimination provides the highest degree of risk reduction because you're not going to work with this biological agent and at the same time, you're not going to be at risk to be doing it. The second most effective control measure is substitution. This type of mitigation measure replaces the procedures or the biological agent with a similar entity in order to reduce the risk. Like for example, here is a laboratory conducting research with a pathogenic strain of bacillus that is bacillus anthracis. This bacteria class is responsible for causing the acute fatal disease known as anthrax and this has caused the plague in Europe. So instead of using this bacillus anthracis, we could uh, use a substitute which is a less dangerous experimental surrogate such as the Bacillus thuringiensis, known as an organism most commonly used in biological pesticides worldwide. The third control measure is the setting of engineering controls. This includes physical changes in workstations, equipment, production facilities, or any other relevant aspect of the work environment that can reduce or prevent exposure to hazards. Examples include the installation of biosafety cabinets where we process biological agents and specimens in order to prevent direct contact 
to those pathogens and to avoid illness and diseases that comes from them. Cabinets, safety equipment. So that includes centrifuge with a cover, the autoclave, and machines with indicators. Facility design enabling proper airflow. Ventilation system to ensure directional airflow and air treatment systems to decontaminate or remove agents from exhaust air. There can also be controlled access zones. So you place their notes or um, stickers that con contains controlled access zones. Air locks as laboratory in entrances or separate buildings or modules to isolate the laboratory. The fourth measure is the setting of administrative controls. This refers to the policies, standards, and guidelines used to control the risk. Examples would be proficiency and competency training for laboratory staff. The displaying also of biohazard or warning signages, markings and labels, controlling visitor and worker access, and documenting written standard operating procedures are some of the examples of administrative controls. Practices and procedures of administrative controls comprise minimizing the splashes, sprays, and aerosols to avoid laboratory-acquired infections or following standard operating procedures. The least effective mitigation measure but the easiest to implement is the use of a personal protective equipment. These are devices worn by workers to protect them against chemicals, toxins, and pathogenic hazards in the laboratory. The very essence of universal precautions simply defined is that healthcare workers should prevent and avoid exposure to blood. Each individual should practice this concept. The key to universal precautions class is to prevent skin and mucous membrane exposure. That's why impermeable laboratory gowns, coats, or aprons should be worn during procedures that are likely to produce splashes of blood or any type of body fluids. Laboratory gowns must not be laundered at home. And the use of disposable laboratory gowns is often the best solution if laundry services cannot be provided. The eyes, nose, and mouth should be protected when splashes are possible. The protective devices include glasses, face shields, and masks. Let me introduce to you some of the different personal protective equipments that we can use in the laboratory. A face mask class is a loose-fitting, disposable device that creates a physical barrier between the mouth and nose of the wearer and potential contaminants in the immediate environment. Face masks may be labeled as surgical, laser, isolation, dental or medical procedure masks, and they may come with or without a face shield. Face masks are not intended to be used more than once. And face mask also class are made in different thickness and with different ability to protect the wearer from contact with liquids. These properties may also affect how easily you can breathe through the face mask and how well the face mask protects you. If worn properly, a face mask helps block large particle droplets or splatter that may contain microorganisms from reaching your mouth and nose. Face masks may also help reduce exposure of your saliva and respiratory secretions to others. While a face mask may be effective in blocking splashes and large particle droplets by design, it does not filter or block very small particles in the air that may be transmitted by coughs, sneezes, or certain medical procedures. It also does not provide complete protection from microorganisms and other contaminants because of the loose fit between the surface of the face mask and the face. Next would be laboratory safety goggles. 
Goggles or safety glasses are protective eyewear that are usually enclosed or protected around the area surrounding the eye in order to prevent particulates, water, or chemicals from striking the eyes. There is a higher standard observed for manufacturing laboratory goggles. The usual feature is combined with impact resistance with side shields to prevent chemical splashes reaching the eyes and laser protection which would be covered by EN207. So that's the European Community Standards for Laser Safety Eyewear or ANSIZ136. This is the US Standards Class. Comparing the two standards, EN207 is stricter than ANSIZ136 that only regulates optical density. Goggles certified with EN207 must not only absorb laser light of a given wavelength, but also be able to withstand a direct hit from the laser without breaking or melting. In general, Goggles used in laboratories must be able to withstand a continuous wave laser for 10 seconds or 100 pulses for a pulsed laser. An example of goggles used in the laboratory is the red adaptation or dark adapter goggles which are used to adapt their eyes to view the light produced by fluorescent screens during fluoroscopic. The other one would be surgical gowns. These are garments worn during medical procedures. Gowns help prevent contamination between the caregivers and the patients, and also they protect the laboratory personnel's clothing. One should consider when using a surgical gown to cover the trunk, arms, legs, and clothing when someone else has body fluids such as blood, respiratory secretions, vomit, urine or feces may be splattered. Surgical gowns, which also include isolation gowns, are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. FDA makes sure that manufacturers of these devices meet performance criteria such as penetration resistance and tear resistance. Another important PPE are gloves. Medical gloves are disposable gloves used during medical procedures. Gloves help prevent contamination between laboratory personnel and patients. Some are designed to prevent contact with certain chemotherapy drugs. Medical gloves include examination gloves, surgical gloves, and medical gloves for handling chemotherapy agents. So you call those chemotherapy gloves. These gloves are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. FDA makes sure that manufacturers of these devices meet performance criteria such as leak resistant, tear resistance, and etc. Some people are allergic to the natural rubber latex used in some medical gloves. FDA requires manufacturers to identify on the package labeling the materials used to make the gloves. If you are allergic to natural rubber latex, you should choose gloves made from other synthetic materials such as polyvinyl chloride or the PVC, nitriol, or polyurethane. In using the gloves, these are some important points to remember. Number one, be aware that sharp objects can still puncture medical gloves. Always change your gloves if they rip or tear. After removing your gloves, you make sure to wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water or use any alcohol-based hand rub. Never ever reuse medical gloves. Never wash or disinfect medical gloves. And never share medical gloves with other users. Another general PPE would be the disposable frill caps. These are made of polypriline spun-bound non-woven with double-string elastic bands. 
These caps are also known as nurse caps or bofun caps. These are unisex caps which are immensely used in catering, pharmaceuticals, hospitality, industrial safety applications, healthcare setups, and others. The use of these caps is recommended in low to medium risk areas like hospital wards and intensive care units for cleaning and sweeping, housekeeping staff, and patients' attendance. The N95 respirator is a respiratory protective device designed to achieve a very close facial fit and very efficient filtration of airborne particles. In addition to blocking splashes, sprays, and large droplets, it is also designed to prevent the wearer from breathing in very small particles present in the air. The name N95 class means that when subjected to careful testing, the respirator blocks at least 95% of test particles. If properly fitted, the filtration capabilities of and N95 respirators exceed those of face masks. However, even a properly fitted N95 respirator does not completely eliminate the risk of illness or death. However, N95 respirators are not designed for children or people with facial hair because a proper fit cannot be achieved and the respirator may not be able to provide full protection. Also, people with chronic respiratory, cardiac, or other medical conditions that have difficulty to breathe should be careful in using an N95 respirator because it requires more effort to breathe. Some models are provided with exhalation valves that can make breathing out easier and help reduce heat buildup. All N95 respirators cleared by Food and Drug Administration are labeled as single-use, disposable devices. Most N95 respirators are manufactured for use in construction and other industrial-type jobs that expose workers to dust and small particles. These respirators are evaluated for effectiveness by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, which is part of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. These are labeled for occupational use. N95 respirators cleared by FDA for use in the healthcare setting are called surgical N95 respirators. These devices meet some of the same performance standards as surgical face masks and are also National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health certified to meet the N95 respirator performance requirements. The last pillar of the biorisk management model is performance evaluation. This involves a systemic process intended to achieve organizational objectives and goals. The model ensures that the implemented mitigation measures are indeed reducing or eliminating the risks. It also helps to highlight biorisk strategies that are not working effectively and measures that are ineffective or unnecessary. These can be eliminated or replaced. Under the performance evaluation procedures is still a cycle. You have to identify the key issues of concern. We'll also have to define the outcome. So you place indicators as well as metrics. You also define activities and still place indicators and metrics. You collect data and report indicator results, providing findings from performance indicators, and lastly, evaluate and refine performance indicators. And the cycle goes on. Performance management is simply a re-evaluation of the overall mitigation strategy. The result of a robust risk assessment must be properly recorded, documented, and communicated to all stakeholders of the organization, 
only through this final process that findings could be decided upon, given appropriate action, to be able to provide and establish a clear manifestation of implementing the fundamental concept of biosafety and biosecurity in the laboratory. A framework that integrates all the best practices and procedures can be found in the CWA 15793 Biorisk Management System Standards. This ensures that an organization can effectively achieve all of its objectives and revolves around the Plan, Do, Check, Act. This one is very understandable. Plan, we establish the objectives and processes necessary to deliver results in accordance with the organization's health and safety policy. And then, after you plan, you do your plan or you implement the process. And after you implement it, you check or monitor and measure processes against health and safety policy, objectives, legal and other requirements, and then report the results. And lastly, you act on it. You take actions to continually improve health and safety for performance. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've learned something new from me today. And I also hope that you've written a lot of side notes so that it will be easier for you to study my examination. See you soon!